Good morning, Grace. Let's stand together. Let's lift this up to him. And come, let us worship our King. And come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. You see what our Savior has done. And see how His love overcomes. He has done great things. And He Church, it's great to see you, great to be with you this morning. When you came in, you should have gotten like a little communion cup. We're going to do that here at the end of the service. And for those of you online, we just want to welcome you as well. And if you want to participate in the Lord's Supper with us, man, just find some of those elements and uh, it'll be at the end of the service. But for those of you here, why don't you turn to someone next to you and just welcome someone to church today. Come on back. We want to teach you a new song this morning, and it's um, it's one of those songs that's straight out of Scripture. It's out of Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer. 
And so Jesus Christ taught his disciples how to pray, and by extension, he teaches us how to pray, and it's in this song. But before we sing the song, I'd love for us to just read this scripture together. It's gonna be on the screen. Uh, it goes like this, it's Matthew 6, where is that? There it is. Let's read this together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. All right, this is a new song. We just want to teach you. All right, it goes like this. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come.
Is this therefore since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God amen Sing this together. See him there, the great I am, a crown of thorns upon his head, and the Father's heart displayed for us. Oh God, we thank you for. Lifted up on Calvary's hill, we cursed your name, and even still, you bore our shame and paid the cost. Oh God, we thank you for the cross. We hold the land. Story of redemption written on his hands. Jesus, you will reign forevermore, and the victory is yours. We sing your praise and this hallelujah to your holy name. Jesus, you will reign. Savior. 
and we'll bow before the King of Kings, oh God, forever we will sing and we'll sing. Good morning. It's good to see you. Thanks for being here today at EP. Uh, welcome everyone in the chapel, Chaska, and online. You know, uh, Sherry and I recently celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary. 30. Big 3-0. Yeah, May the 21st, 1994. Hard to believe that I talked her into marrying me, and then hard to believe it's been three decades you know, thinking back, I would describe my proposal to her as heartfelt but haphazard. Heartfelt in the sense that I really meant it, like the love was there, the love is there, but haphazard in the execution. So I didn't do it over a romantic dinner. I didn't ride in wearing a cape on a white horse. I didn't write a song. I didn't pin a poem, I didn't have flowers, I didn't even have the ring yet, right? I didn't want to like, like go out on the limb and make that big purchase without like feeling good about a big yes, right? I didn't have that kind of money, you know what I'm saying? So I want to get a yes, then I'll get you the ring. And so after I propose, she's like, do you have a ring? And I'm like, it's on its way, it's on its way. Uh, but I didn't do any of that, right? Kind of heartfelt, but haphazard. And honestly, I just did it. Like I just, I just like blurted, right? Will you marry me? And I think I did it after an argument even. That may explain why she said, can we get a second opinion on this before she said yes to this? Well, we ended up having nine groomsmen and nine bridesmaids because I, I kept inviting all my friends. So I'd run in and go, hey, I haven't seen you. Well, you want to be in my wedding, man? And Sherry's like, what are you, what are you doing, right? So we, we got off uh, a little bit there at the beginning, kind of a little out of hand there. But I remember during the actual wedding itself, I was a, a bundle of nerves. It was kind of like an out-of-body experience for me on many levels. I mean, honestly, I remember feeling like I was a groomsman and then having to remind myself, dude, you are the groom. This is you. Look where you're standing, right? This is happening. Like, stay focused. Snap out of this funk that you're in, thinking all of these things, not hearing anything at all the pastor was saying. Now, Sherry, she's calm and cool, and Sherry essentially planned the entire 
ceremony. The scripture reading, the hymns, a couple of hymns. Uh, a guy she knew played the Star Spangled Banner on his trumpet. I'm, I'm just kidding. Not really. We didn't have a trumpeter there. He didn't play the Star Spangled Banner. I don't know why I said that. Uh, she, uh, she had like an interpretive dance. You remember those? The interpretive dance days? It had a, I would say, I would describe it like this. Our wedding had a groovy Napoleon Dynamite 90s feel and, and vibe to it. And I, I only had one demand, an Elvis Presley groom's cake. So I think I have a picture too. That's the actual <laughs> cake in the wedding. Let, leave that up for a minute. That's amazing. That's actually carrot cake. That's my invention, my invention. Here are a couple of other pictures. There's, so there's the day, May 21st, 1994. We're going on our honeymoon. Now, wait a minute, look at that guy. Does he look like he has a clue? He's like, he's clueless. <laughs> kind of a dopey looking guy, has no idea what's ahead of him, right? And Sherry's just like along for the ride. So we were heading on our honeymoon to an unbelievable like hot spot, right? For, for honeymoons, Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Straight to Dollywood, baby. <laughs> Straight to Dollywood. And the reason was because we had like a free accommodation there. We stayed there for like three days, got bored and came back. So that's how that went down. Well, as you know, we are, we are in Revelation 19. And this chapter describes a marriage that will take place in heaven. It is called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I'm going to tell you, this is the celebration of all celebrations that Christians of all ages and stages have anticipated since Jesus Christ saved them. Now, before we jump into chapter 19, let, let, me just, let me just give you some exciting news, okay? You ready for this? We made it. We made it through the tribulation together as a church. And you're still coming, kind of, right? You're still, you're still here, which is amazing to me. But you think about this. For months, we have been slogging through the mud and the muck and the mire of the great tribulation like ad nauseum. We have uncovered each little turn and phrase of the day of the Lord. We have poured through the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls of God's judgment and wrath. And we've done that for 12 long, grueling chapters. And finally, finally, the tribulation atrocities are finished. And in stark contrast to what we have studied over the past several months, this is a blowout celebration, a great victory as the Alleluia chorus is sung in heaven. So Revelation 19, 1 to 10 is a scene that takes place exclusively in heaven, the marriage supper of the Lamb. So let's stand together in honor of God's word. John writes, after this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God for his judgments are true and just for he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more, they cried out, hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord, our God, the almighty Reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory. And here it is. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony 
of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So glad you're here today. So here's the, uh, here's the, the scene before us, okay? There is a great multitude in heaven, in heaven crying out in unison, crying out in victory. There are the 24 elders, the four living creatures that are worshiping the one who is seated upon the throne. And so all of this kind of tells us that the answer to the catastrophic nature of the tribulation is salvation. And salvation belongs to God, verse 1. So think of it like this, the way out, the way through, the way to victory belongs to God and God alone. And then notice here the specific reasons for this passionate worship. Look at verse 2. His judgments are true and just. He's judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality. He's avenged on her the blood of his servants. So, so God is wildly celebrated because of all that he has, has done for his people. I'm going to put this on the screen. God is wildly celebrated really for three reasons here. So these all feed this passionate worship scene. By the way, this will be in the Grace app, right? You don't have to take a picture. Here's why God is worshiped. His judgments are true and just, right? His assessments of things are perfect. His evaluations are full of integrity. They are righteous. Why else is God worshiped in heaven? Because he's judged the corruption and the wickedness of the antichrist false religion and poisonous political system. And thirdly, God has avenged the blood of his servants, meaning God did not forget his people. God kept his word. His words are true. Their deaths for following Jesus Christ were not in vain. And so once more, verse 3, they cried out, hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. Her, by the way, is what? That's Babylon, right? Remember, Babylon comprises every evil government, Every evil, wicked political system, financial sector, false religion that opposes God and the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. So she, Babylon, is, is done forever. So this evil machine, this evil regime will never do harm again. As such, there's this like huge sigh of relief from God's people. Like, it's over. Like God kept his word. God said he was going to see us through and God has seen us through. The pilgrimage on earth is over. The suffering of earth is over. The persecution the Antichrist has unleashed on followers of Jesus Christ is over. And now they're home. Think about that. They're home and that's worth celebrating and that's worth singing about. And so God's servants, small and great, are called to praise him, verse 5. Moreover, I want you to notice, like this kind of stuck out to me here. There are like hallelujahs tucked everywhere in this text. Did you notice that? Uh, you see verse 1, verse 3, verse 4, verse 6. The word hallelujah is a, is a great word. Halal means joyous praise. Yah is a shortened form of Yahweh. So hallelujah, every time you say hallelujah, that means God be joyously praised. And that's the scene that you see in heaven. And so the worship of God explodes. It is loud, it is expressive, it is jubilant, and it is centered in, on, and around God and God alone. Why? Because of verse six. Because the Lord God Almighty reigns. God has flexed his muscles and God has seen his people through until the end. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. That's what you have going on. That's the feeling here amongst God's people. It's a powerful, powerful image. Now, you might be wondering like, all right, in saying that the Lord God Almighty reigns, are you suggesting then that he wasn't reigning during the tribulation? No, I'm not suggesting that at all. He absolutely was reigning during the tribulation. 
But during the tribulation, God will let evil men and evil spirits and evil systems have more freedom than they have even now. So understand this about God. And this may not feel true to you, but it's true nonetheless. God is currently holding evil back. God is currently restraining evil. Evil is on a leash, but evil is going to be unleashed, if you will, during the tribulation. But here's what we know. This will all be short-lived. The end of the road is coming for evil men and evil spirits and their evil systems. And then finally, we see the culmination of our relationship with Jesus Christ take center stage. Look in verse 7. Here it is. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory. All focus on him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. His bride has made herself ready. So obviously, this is symbolism. The Lamb is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ then is the groom in this relationship. But who is the bride? The bride is the the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. Ephesians 5, 22 to 33 compares the union of a husband and a wife to that of Jesus Christ and the church. And so every single believer in Jesus Christ becomes the collective bride of Jesus Christ. Now, it is fascinating to me, amazing to me, that God actually chose this intimate picture of marriage to describe the deep relationship that he desires to have with his church and how he loves his people. And today, just so you kind of get your head wrapped around this, today we are in phase one of this arrangement. Think of it like this. We are engaged to Jesus Christ. We have no physical contact with him. We don't see him, but we, but we love him, and we're getting to know him. How are we getting to know him? We're getting to know him through, through his word. And we are, we are living on, we are banking on, we are resting on the promises that he's made to us, that he's going to come again for us. And then one day, very soon, Jesus will come. He will return in the second phase, which is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, how long will the marriage supper of the Lamb last? So I've been to a lot of weddings. They usually last, you know, four, five, six hours, including the reception. This one's going to last a thousand years. It's going to be the blowout of all blowouts, right? The marriage supper of the Lamb. And so what are we doing right now as the church? We're getting ourselves ready for his return. We're engaged, but one day we're going to be married when he comes back. So we're, we're prepping ourselves for the return of Jesus Christ. Now, every single bride I know understands that concept called preparation. Amen? Ladies, amen? So it's really interesting to me. So I I did a wedding probably two or three weeks ago, and the wedding started at 4 o'clock, and the requirement from the bride was that everybody get there at like 5 a.m., right? And I'm like, (laughs) how long do we need, like, even on the day to get prepared for the day, right? But they understand preparation. I'm a a game day player, so if the wedding starts at four, I'm a 358 guy, you know what I mean? I come in, (laughs) I come in, get mic'd up, high five them, let's pray, let's roll, and then we do our thing, right? I don't like to overthink it, right? I don't like to feel the pressure of that. But every bride understands preparation. And you need to understand as the church, we are in the preparation phase as the body of Jesus Christ. So how do we get ourselves ready? Well, the first way we get ourselves ready is by turning from our sin and trusting in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. We start following Jesus Christ right now. We start taking Jesus Christ seriously right now. We recognize we are engaged to him and that he is coming back one day. Bridegroom. We're waiting for that day. And what you need to know is that every Christian is going to be at that wedding. Not only that, you're going to be in it. You're a part of the bride of Christ, the church. 
And then it says this in verse eight. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. Like what we wear matters. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. So let me explain this. I understand the pain in that, yes. <laughs> ah! It's like a small animal back there that got loose. <laughs> Ultimately, the drabness or the lavishness of the attire of our garment is going to be determined by our obedience and our service to Jesus Christ in the here and now. Now let me clarify this. I'm gonna put this on the screen so you understand what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. You are not saved by your doing, but by his dying, amen? You're not saved based on anything you do. We're not relying on what we do. We are relying on his sacrifice on the cross for us. You're not saved by your doing, but by his dying. You're not saved by your works, but by his work on the cross. And then this last one, say it with me. You are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. One more time, you are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We know that to be true. But there will be an evaluation of our motives, of our service, of our participation in the body of Christ, of our sacrifice, our heart for the church. So our position in the kingdom and our rewards are determined by our love for God, our love for one another. You know, the Bible talks about how we are to love one another. It will be determined by our love for the world, by our service, by our sacrifice. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where he said that our works of service will either survive the fire or they will not. Wood, hay, and stubble if our motives are wrong. And so here's where we are now. We're prepping ourselves for the return of Jesus Christ. We're figuring out then how to live Christianly in a hostile culture towards the gospel. Now, I want you to notice here that there's one big time miscalculation from the apostle John. Did you note that in verse 10? What happens in verse 10? John's like all caught up in the heat of the moment, right? And he, he did what? Everybody's falling down. So he falls down at the feet of the angel to worship the angel and got rebuffed, got slammed. Look at verse 10. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. <laughs> like knock that off, basically. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. And then here's his mandate. What is it? What are you doing? Worship God. Like worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What a picture, right? You're worshiping the wrong being. Don't bow down to me. You worship God and God alone. And here's why. The spirit, right? The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. Now, this is amazing what this translates, what this means for us, right? It means that Jesus is the substance of all prophecy. So everything the Bible is talking about has a central character. Who's that central character? Jesus. Everything in the Old Testament points forward to his coming. The Gospels reveal who he is. And then from Acts all the way through Revelation, we kind of figure out the significance and the ramifications of who Jesus Christ is. So he is the central character of the Bible, making him deserving of all worship. So all true prophecy bears witness to the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. Jesus, think of it like this. He's the heart and soul of all prophecy. He's the heart and soul of the word. He's the point of everything. Uh, he is the one who's going to bring the great conclusion. Uh, he is the climax. He is the pinnacle. He is the apex. He is the summation to our world. He is, he is God's exclamation point. And so the purpose of prophecy is to testify to the greatness of Jesus throughout the Bible. 
So understand that prophecy is not primarily concerned about like God's in the time program, like how it's all going to fall out in the last days. Now, God's in time program is not about a program. It's about a person. And it is about the person of Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is the central celebrity in God's economy. Amen. Like it is all about him. So if you're reading the Bible and you are not falling more and more in love with Jesus, you are not reading the Bible rightly because everything centers in, on, and around the life and death and resurrection and second coming of Jesus Christ. Mic drop right there. Be a good place for an amen from the church, right? And so, and so like, what is God saying to us today? Well, I think the first thing that God is saying to us today is like worship God only. And I get that's kind of like a captain obvious truth. Like, oh, wow, that's really profound. Worship God. Yeah, like we get that. Well, I I would say this. It's sort of been man's MO throughout the ages to worship things and people and persons and rituals other than God. So it's not as easy for us as we think, whether it's saints or angels or Jesus' mother or their dead relatives or dead idols. The Bible is clear that all devotion, all prayer, and all worship is to go to God and God alone. And that's exactly what the angel said to John. The angel didn't say, hey, well, you got to talk to me. I'll get a word to God for you. No, he said, listen, don't worship me. I'm a servant like you and your brothers. Worship God. And then he tells us why. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, meaning the whole Bible is about one person. The whole Bible is about elevating, celebrating, communicating, loving, sharing, and glorifying the one name above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. No one else on this planet is deserving of worship save Jesus Christ. Amen? It's all about Jesus. And we want to make sure that we're worshiping him that we're not clamoring for dead idols, but for a living Savior. What else is God saying to us today? I think he's telling us today to grow in our understanding of and our appreciation for salvation. Like, listen, the gift here is salvation. And we've got to be like advancing in, progressing in our knowledge of, our understanding of, all that God has accomplished for us at the cross. Now, of course, listen, we know that we are saved from God's wrath. We know that we are saved from hell. But salvation is much more than just being saved from sin's penalty. So that's what happens the very moment you ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior. I want you to hear this. When you trust in Jesus Christ to be your Savior, the Bible says this, and we've talked about it, you immediately pass from death to life. Immediately. John 5, 24. You have eternal life, and you are saved from the penalty of sin. But you are also, secondly, being saved from the power of sin over your life. Life, So you're saved from the penalty of sin and you are saved from the power of sin over your life. So what does that mean? Well, it means you don't have to be a slave to sin anymore. You don't have to be pushed around by sin anymore. You don't have to be bullied by sin anymore. Like sin can't boss you around anymore. Why? Because the power of Christ is in you. Right? And the power of Christ in you is greater than the sin that tries to take you down. And then one day, and this is the day we're reading about here in Revelation 19, you'll be saved from the very presence of sin itself. So think about that day. There will be a day in your future, because you've trusted in Jesus Christ, the penalty of sin, right, forever free. God is no longer holding your sins against you. You are saved from the power of sin. You don't have to be dominated by sin anymore, bullied by sin anymore. And one day, the presence of sin is going to be absent 
from your life forever. You won't be dogged by sin anymore. How many of you are like, hallelujah for that day? You know, the Bible talks about us having glorified bodies. And one of the things I thought about with that is like, well, it doesn't have anything to do with measurements, right? What does a glorified body look like? Nothing to do with measurements, but everything to do with this. Your body will not fight against you anymore. How many of you know what that feels like? When your body fights against you, the older I get, the more I fight against my body and the sin that dwells, right? The indwelling sin that is in me. Well, one day you have a glorified body and you will not have to contend with an enemy called sin any longer. So you are, you are saved, you are being saved, and your future is literally out of this world. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? So here's what I would say. If salvation doesn't feel like relief to you, like you've, you've won the lottery a million times over and over and over. If it doesn't feel like that to you, if it's not the most incredible news ever to you, if it is not the most amazing blessing ever to you, then you still don't fully understand it yet. I would say it like this. Nothing should be more interesting to you than God's gift of salvation for you. Amen? And that's what Revelation 19 does. Like these saints who are in heaven are like, oh my goodness, this was all real, it's all true. Look around, how amazing, how incredible. He kept his word, we're alive, we're victorious. Hallelujah to the lamb, amen? That's what this picture is in Revelation chapter 19. And then thirdly, I think God is saying to us today that you are invited to the greatest wedding event ever. So I intentionally said verse nine until now. Look at this. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but there are seven beatitudes in the book of Revelation. This is the fourth of the seven. So in a few weeks here, I will walk through all seven of these Beatitudes. Blessed are those. But here's the point in this Beatitude. You are invited to the most important wedding in history. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're not just invited to the wedding, you're in it. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ yet, there's an invitation with your name on it. Isn't that incredible? Like blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The price has been paid. The ticket's been bought through the blood of Jesus Christ. And I hope, I hope, especially in light of like the past several months where we've been like slugging it out through chapters 6 through 18, I hope more than anything else here today, whoever you are, that you finally, fully realize just how much God loves you. And I had to go back and go, okay, like we've been in the tribulation a long time. I'm going to bury these people if we're not careful here, right? So you need to hear that God loves you. And if you have not trusted Jesus Christ yet, you're, you're invited, you're invited. You're included, right? You're invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And what a picture that is. I mean, come on, like that God chose the metaphor of marriage to communicate his love for you and his commitment to you is literally the greatest news ever. Amen? So we are in the engagement phase right now. And one of the things I love about performing weddings, so I performed a wedding just a few weeks ago, and I, I love the vantage point that I have. So I will slide in the side with the groom. We'll come and stand in the front. I'll have everybody rise. And then all eyes are on the bride as she walks down the aisle. And one of the things that I love to do 
is I love to look into the eyes of the groom as he makes eye contact for the very first time on that wedding day with the eyes of his bride. There's nothing else like it. And that day's coming for you. And that day is coming for me. And so right now we're living on the promises, right? That he's coming again, he's coming again, he's coming again, and we're banking on these promises to be true. And he's he a promise keeper to us. But one day, we're not going to be relying on promises anymore. We're going to be doing what? Eyeball to eyeball, face to face with Jesus Christ. And it'll be the greatest day ever. And you'll realize it's all true. It's all true. And I'm loved. And I'm valued. And I'm in. You will be blown away. You will be speechless. You will hit your knees more quickly than anything else as you're blown away by the amazing truth and grace and mercy and love of God as demonstrated through his son, Jesus Christ. So what I want to do today is I want to give you a chance to ask Jesus to come into your life. You're invited, so you've got to receive that invitation today. So if you would, bow your heads with me. If you have never prayed and asked Christ to come into your life, we had a 17-year-old this morning, first service, prayed, trusted Christ. I'm in. So I'm going to give you a chance right here, right now, to pray and ask Jesus Christ into your life to receive the invitation to the feasts of all feasts. Amen? So you pray with me. Make these words your words. Mean them in your heart. Just pray with me. God, I need a Savior because I know I'm a sinner. And I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again three days later. And so by faith, I want to turn from my sins, and I want to trust in Jesus alone. So Jesus, would you come into my life? Would you save my life? life. Would you write my name in the Lamb's book of life? I want to know you, and I want to live forever with you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. That's you today. Come let us know. Make your way to the prayer room. Let folks know so we can kind of help you with that next step. Now, today we're going to uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And this is going to be super meaningful especially in light of the text that we're talking about today. So the Lord's Supper is sort of a dress rehearsal, if you will, for the marriage supper of the Lamb. The Lord's Supper is a, is a foretaste of the marriage supper of the Lamb. The Lord's Supper is an appetizer for the feast that is to come. What a picture, amen? So we, we celebrate the Lord's Supper on our way to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And you know, as I, I thought about the bread and the cup and this whole picture of food, I thought, you know, food, food itself is a kind of a parable of our impermanence, right? It's a sign of our transience. It's a sign of our, our neediness, a sign of our weakness, right? You grow hungry, you eat, you get full, then what happens like three hours later? You're hungry again. And that's what the Lord's Supper does, right? It reminds us that we are, we are needy of a Savior. But it also points us to a Savior. That when you ask Jesus to come into your life, you never have to hunger and thirst again. Like he satisfies us like no one else does. Jesus said it like this, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty again. So here's what we want to do. We want to remember the one who satisfies our souls and recognize the Lord's Supper is a dress rehearsal, an appetizer along the way as we make our way to the amazing marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen? So now we understand a little more fully how it all fits together. So 
when we celebrate the supper, you wanna examine yourself. You wanna confess sin. You wanna make sure that you genuinely know Jesus Christ. So, so the Lord's Supper is for those who have already professed faith in Jesus Christ. And it reminds us then of the depth of Christ's love and sacrifice for us. It recenters us on the life and death and resurrection and second coming of, of Jesus. All of this accomplishing our salvation. And our hearts should be full of gratitude and thankfulness and love. And hear this, resolve to preach his death to our neighbors and to the nations until he comes again. We're engaged and we want other people to be engaged so one day they too will experience the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. So let's take this. This little cup with the bread represents the broken body of Jesus Christ. It's broken for you. He loves you. So let's take and eat and let's remember his sacrifice. And then the cup, representing the shed blood of Jesus Christ, where he gave his life blood so we could be forgiven of the penalty and the power and the future presence of sin. He's defeated it forever. It's an amazing gift called salvation. Let's drink this in remembrance of him. God, we honor you. We honor your gift of salvation through Jesus. Thank you for inviting us and not leaving us out, but including us in the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we respond this morning. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died. Praise the Lord. 
over this place we sing. imagery. Jesus is coming for his bride and one day he'll lock eyes with his bride. I look forward to that day. Do you? We got to be ready for it. We got to be ready. If you prayed to surrender your life to Jesus today, tell somebody, come on down to the front and let us know. We'd love to walk with you in that journey. So glad you've come today. A couple of quick reminders. The Stop the Trafficking 5K is this coming weekend. All right, if you've already registered, pick up your race packets right out in the commons. Annual meeting then is the following Sunday, Sunday, June 23rd. You won't want to miss that. For more information, go to the Connect page at grace.church slash connect. If you came prepared to give, you know the normal ways that we have to give at the entrances of the exits as you leave at the giving stations online at grace.church slash give and also within the Grace app. Let's pray as we're dismissed. God in heaven, we are grateful to you that you have provided us a way to be saved from the penalty of our sins and from the power of sin while we're on this earth and then from the presence of sin in heaven. We bless you and praise you. King Jesus, we exalt you. Help us to walk with you as we leave this place. We pray it in your powerful name. And everybody said, see you later. <laughs>